Um, welcome. We are here to talk about improving your automated MDM enrollments. I'm Joel. Hey, Joel. How you doing? Glad to see you all. I think this is this is number four, right? Of Macadoc. All right. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, last week was uh, another continent, and then a continent in the middle, and then here. So I'm vaguely aware of what time it is, but according to my slides, we're in London. Um, it's always good to put this in there so you know where you are uh, and everything else. Uh, we're going to be talking about primarily around Nomad Login. Who's currently a Nomad Login user? Ooh, who wants to be a Nomad Login user? All right, that's what we're excited about. So we've got some very cool new things to show off. Um, some of this will have nothing to do with logging into your machine. It just so happens since we own the login window, uh, we can actually do a lot of things like show progress bars and uh, take user input and things like that. And I'm very excited to say that I've outsourced most of this presentation to someone else. So he'll be up here in a little bit showing you how to actually use it in the real world. Uh, but a couple of things. Uh, Neil, when he comes up, is going to be talking about Nomad Login AD 1.3. And within there, we've added a couple of cool new features. Uh, being able to deny local authentication, force everybody to authenticate to uh, AD if you want them to. Um, some ways of excluding particular users. So if you want to allow some users to authenticate locally, perhaps your local IT admin account and things like that, you can still do that. Uh, we've got much better error messaging than we had before. So this is a, a screenshot. And if you look down at the bottom, you see some red text that says authentication failed. So now we've got a little more feedback for the user. Uh, so that's really cool. But the really fun things, and this is what Neil's going to get into, is we have two complete new mechanisms being added for Nomad Login AD. So one of them is going to be the user input. This will allow you to put up a UI and have the user select a variety of different pull downs or other options. And again, this is entirely independent of how you're authenticating the user. So if you want the user to authenticate at the login uh, with just a standard Mac OS username and password, and have the standard Mac OS login window, you're more than capable of having that. We can run these screens either before or after that happens. Obviously, if you want to use all of Nomad Login to actually do the authentication and everything else, that's great as well. Um, whoops, got ahead of myself. And then we have the Notify screen. Uh, notify is what we call our placebo bar. Uh, this allows you to uh, let the user know that something's going to happen before the next thing happens. And you're able to completely manage all of the text and everything else that's going on to that. Uh, who's using DEP Notify right now? Beautiful. Uh, the P is silent, so you should call it Denotify. <laughs> no? Uh, tough crowd. Uh, all right. So uh, everything that you know and love from DEP Notify, about 80 to 90% of it is shown up into this Notify mechanism for the login window. So if you like the workflow of DEP Notify, you like that kind of interaction with the user, all of that can be now done at the login window. Uh, and again, this is also independent of how you're actually signing in. So if you want to use the standard Mac OS login window, you're more than welcome to do that. If you want to use Nomad Login AD, you're more than welcome to do that as well. So I've always been jealous. Uh, Greg Nagel has come up here before, and he like merges a new monkey build uh, in the middle of the session. And I thought that was really cool. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to hit, this screen is really large. Uh, but I'm going to scroll down here, and so we're merging 1.3 in there. Um, that's going to think about itself for a little bit. And then I'm going to merge in the documentation, save changes. And then we've got some more stuff on the wiki. Scroll down, scroll down. There we go. And I'm going to hit that. So I'm very excited to say that 1.3 is now live while Neil comes up here and, yeah! Well, Neil comes up here and kind of walks you through what he's been doing, um, and there we go, back to the slides. Uh, I'll work on making a package out of all this, so the package should be live very shortly. So with that, I'm going to invite up Neil, and uh, he's going to show you some of the cool stuff that he's been doing with it. Good morning. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Joel for giving me the opportunity to come up here and talk to everybody here. Um, and also thank you for providing all these wonderful tools to the community that 
make people like me look like we know what we're doing. <laughs> so I'm Neil, and I work at the University of East London. I'm on the end user compute team, which is part of IT services. We're centrally managed of all our schools. <laughs> um, but like a lot of you guys here, um, I don't have an IT background traditionally. Um, I used to be a sound engineer. There we go. Um, I'm also an admin on the Mac Admin Slack, which I'm sure most of you are now using at the moment. Um, and there are a few of us admins here at the moment. I've seen uh, Ben around. He, I'm not sure if he's here at the moment. He might be next door. Um, and Jennifer. So come say hello to us if you want to. Um, also, I'm plugging lots of things. Um, I'd like to plug a group we call London Apple Admins. We meet every couple of months in and around central London. Um, we do mini conferences, I guess, an evening of talks, food, drink, beer, pizza, all those lovely things. So do check out the website if you uh, want to come and say hello to us there too. And we are always on the lookout for future venues and speakers. So UEL has um, more than 19,000 students now, I think at the last count. And we're spread over three campuses at Docklands and um, we have two at Stratford. Uh, my team manages about 5,000 PCs and about 500 Macs, so Macs make up about 10% of the estate. Um, but we're really responsible for the experience on both of those platforms, uh, which kind of goes two ways, really, with a one-to-one -one model for staff and more of a sort of shared lab model for students. Um, and for our Macs, we've been managing them with Jamf Pro since around 2015. Uh, last year, we made the switch to Jamf Cloud. Uh, we a very smooth migration indeed, and we've been enjoying it ever since. Um, now, let me take you back in time to last May. Um, I've done Some of you may have seen this. Um, I spoke at the Jamf Nation Roadshow last year, um, and I talked about all the fun we had, oh, fun, and um, re-engineering our provisioning process with all the changes Apple's been making that Armin's been speaking about here. Um, and how we moved away from sort of old-fashioned modular imaging workflows, um, how we got to grips with using Apple's new modern methods, um, like the device enrollment programs uh, with Apple School Manager, um, MDM, all these lovely things. Um, and if you do check out that link, you can read all about that and see the resources from that show there. Um, so I use this word provisioning a lot, and that's the buzzword now. Um, but to me, that means provisioning. It's our goal of getting our Macs deployed, uh, configured, and managed um, so that they're ready to give the experience that we want to our students and staff. Um, now we move on to this sort of second term automation, and that's because I'm lazy and I want the computer to do it for me, or as much of it as it can. So full disclaimer, now um, we are a Jamf shop, as I said before, so a lot of this talk will focus on Jamf, but for your environments where you don't use it, you might use other management tools, hopefully some of the concepts I talk about are universal to different management tools and you'll see how you can adapt them to other things. So for us, um, to manage a Mac the way we want to do it, um, we need to know a couple of bits of information about it first. Um, one piece of information is the Mac's host name and we don't just want to know the host name, we really want to set it uh, because our naming convention um, tells us a lot about how we want to manage our Macs. And you'll see this is one of our typical host names. That might look like some weird string of code. But let's pick it apart. So it tells us the campus and the building and the room number, as well as our own internal asset tag. Oops, and we moved on. Um, so along with the name, um, we like to define a role for our devices. Uh, generally, whether it's going to sit in a member of staff's office in a kind of one-to-one -one type scenario, or whether it's going to be used in a lab by some students, so it's sort of shared use. Um, so the experience we deliver will be different to each. The settings and software we deploy will need to be tailored towards those roles. So with Jamf, we use something called an extension attribute, um, which is Jamf's way of saying an extra piece of data or an extra field in the database, I guess you could say that, about um, a computer that we can define and collect. And we just call that attribute role. And I'd imagine 
other management tools probably have a way to do something similar, or to, a way to categorise your machines and add more information about them. So we know those two bits of information, the name and the role. We can start to build smart groups in Jamf, which will automatically populate, like this one, um, which will show us all, well, all the Macs in this group will be student-facing Macs in our Docklands campus. Um, this one would be all the Macs in the Docklands East building. Um, and this one is just a specific room or a lab. So with this framework, you get a lot, lot of uh, flexibility when it comes to defining all the software and the settings that you want to deploy to your computers. Um, and also depending on who they're being used by and where they are, or combinations of those things. Now, going into this anymore is a little bit beyond the scope of this session. So if it is something you're really interested in, please do have a look at that link there where I've documented this process in a bit more detail. So also our old provisioning workflow with this in mind uh, went something like this. Um, we would begin with a fresh, clean install of macOS. Um, again, no midging. Um, so it's a dirty word, isn't it now? Can't say it anymore. Um, so if, you're, if you've got a brand new Mac, you're fine. Apple have done the work for you. It's ready to go. Um, if you're reprovisioning a Mac you already manage, there are a few ways you can achieve this. Um, again, for our older Macs that don't have the T2 chip, which for us is a lot of our labs, um, I'm still using uh, Net Install, but tailored with a tool called Imager, written by Graham Gilbert over there. Thank you. <laughs> um, once our Macs do go to Mojave, that will probably be the end of Netboot for us. It's been a nice, nice ride. Uh, because once they're in Mojave, they'll all be APFS. And that means we can just use our management tools to deploy the macOS installer application and run start OS install with the raise install flag to wipe them. Um, I thought I'd mention as well, um, as Armin mentioned before, uh, check out Tim Perfit's tool called Mac Deploy Stick, um, which gives you other methods to achieve a similar kind of result. Um, and finally, you do always have macOS internet recovery but once you get past a few machines, it really doesn't scale. And you need a fairly decent internet connection for it. Next up, we get the thing under management. Um, so in our old process, quite a few things would happen here. We, were using, we are using DEP. Um, so we assign our Macs to the pre-stage in Jamf. Um, we would skip all the steps in the setup system as part of this pre-stage. Um, at this point, we do bind to Active Directory, um, and that's so a technician can then hit the login window and log straight in to continue and kick off the rest of the provisioning process. Um, and also behind the scenes, when the Jamf agent is installed, it kicks off a policy um, with its enrolment complete trigger um, and will run a script that drives the rest of the process. So next up, we would be driving one of Joel's other awesome tools, DEP Notify, and that would fire up, and that would tell the provisioner what's happening. Um, now, we built some logic into this, so if the Mac had been provisioned before, and it still had its old record in Jamf, the rest of this process was automated. It, DEP Notify would just tell you what's going on. Um, we'd reuse its old host name and role, and it would get the same software and settings it had before. And then the rest is magic. And we go to the pub. However, in the case of a brand new Mac, or one we're repurposing, where we've deleted its record, we make it so it appears to be new to our management tools. In this situation, we would leverage the user input part of DEP Notify to ask the provisioner to supply the host name and role. and then they're allowed to go to the pub. But there's um, some room for improvement. And when something's not quite right, it can play on my mind a little bit. And this particular conundrum that was going around my mind um, was 
this question. If you're just provisioning a computer for someone else to use, not for yourself, why do you need to log into it? And really the answer is this. Um, Apple's setup assistant doesn't quite do everything we need it to do. Um, it doesn't let us provide the extra information we need so that our management tools can get the right things to our Macs straight away. And it doesn't tell us uh, what's happening, what software's being installed, and so on. So that's why for our environment, uh, DEP Notify really, really worked well to extend the capabilities of the setup assistant. Um, and it gave us these tools to supply information and get feedback, but only after someone logged in first. And then there was no mad login. And please join me as we look at what happened next. And at this point, I do have a confession to make. Um, and that is, I'm only using the notify and user input parts of Nomad Login. As Joel said, it's modular. So right now, we do bind to Active Directory and we do use mobile accounts. Um, <laughs> um, so we're not yet making use of all the awesome stuff it can do with provisioning local accounts based on directory credentials. So I'm really sorry, Joel. But on the flip side of that, Again, Nomad login is modular, um, and that gives us really great flexibility. We can choose to use the parts, or the mechs, as we call them, that we like to suit our environment. Um, and later on, it's really easy to add more mechs in, so we could switch over and start using the login functionality if we wanted to later. So now, again, my goal was to achieve a provisioning workflow where the provisioner didn't need to log in. They, the idea is they'd go through the setup system, and then input the name and the role, or not, if they were just reprovisioning the Mac using its previous ones. So what do we need? We need to start with an installer package that contains Nomad Login. Uh, Joel provides one. Um, this installer package has to be signed with a developer ID certificate because of how we're going to be deploying it with our management tools. It's deployed by MDM. So I suspect other MDMs will probably need this too we're going to deploy this thing at the very beginning of the enrollment process. Um, and you'll need an Apple developer account, again, to get that signing certificate if you're going to make your own package. Um, I took the package provided on the Nomad login GitLab repo, but I did repackage it because I added a few extra things. Um, I added our branding as a logo and wallpaper and did some tweaks to the post install script. So we run this thing. The very first command is something called auth changer. Has anyone um, seen that? A few of you have seen that. Um, auth changer is a really fantastic tool. It comes with Nomad Login. It's included. Um, I think um, a chap called Johan has written most of it. So massive thanks to him. Uh, he's on the Slack as well. I want to say thank you. Um, auth changer makes changes to the authorization database in a nice, safe, uh, clean way. <laughs> So we use AuthChanger to swap out Apple's login window for just the notify mech of Nomad Login in the post install script. And then, if you've used DEP Notify, this may look familiar. Uh, we echo commands we need to a text file to make the notify mech show our logo um, along with the title and the status text that the I'm um, asking the provisioner to wait. And this is exactly the same as DP Notify. The next ingredient we need is a config profile to set all of this up, to set all the preferences. And we are managing the menu.nomad.login.ad domain. There we go. And some keys that we set. Um, we would tell Nomad Login AD to use our background image. And we would tell the notify part of Nomad Login AD to pass the Jamf log so that the status text at the bottom of the notify mech will update to show package installs um, as, it, as they happen when they're run by policies. Um, this supports other management tools. I believe you can put other things in here like Monkey um, and some others 
to pass their respective logs as well. And then we come to the settings we need for Nomad Login's user input screen. Oops, no, we set the logo. My bad. Um, so with the user input, sorry, I'm just going to go back one. Yes, we do. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> so we're setting up now the user input mech of Nomad Login. Um, we're going to tell it the path to our logo. And then a block of main text, what that's going to be, so we can provide some instructions to our provisioner. And then we can tell user input where it's going to store the information our provisioner provides. Um, that's in the form of an XML property list file or text file. And we can give the user input window a nice title. Lastly, we can define the different user input or user interface elements that we'll need. Um, this is all done under the user input UI preference. Um, but it's fairly complicated because each group of elements is defined as what's called a nested dictionary um, if you work with property lists. Um, I'll make this profile available um, after this so that you can use it as a template. Um, and I also give a shout out to a tool called Profile Creator by a chap called Eric Berglund. Um, I believe it has a manifest or template for Nomad Login AD, which at some point I'm assuming will be updated for this new stuff. So there'll be a nice GUI soon for this if someone wants to step up and do that. Um, so we define a button that says OK. And for us, we'll have just one drop-down menu. I believe you can have up to four of each. Uh, we'll have one drop-down menu, and we'll call it Computer Roll, and we'll give three choices, student, staff, and a special one called Staff Loan. We treat our loaners, loaner devices a little bit differently. And we'll have a text field that just says Computer Name. And we'll put a bit of placeholder text in there as well, just to remind the person provisioning of our naming convention. So we have our signed package with Nomad Login and our branding and post install script. And we have a profile to set all the preferences we need. Well, let's get them into our MDM solution. And then, again, this is Jamf. So the next few bits are going to be fairly Jamf specific. But remember, these concepts can be achieved with other tools. So the first thing we need is a, what's called a pre-stage enrollment to determine what's going to happen when you hit our old friend that remote management screen when we hit that DEP process. Um, and if you're running Jamf, you'll see some new options that let us add configuration profiles and packages to the pre-stage, with the idea being that they're installed before the setup assistant completes. So we define our configuration profile and our signed package. And again, it has to be signed because it's delivered by, I think, believe it's the install application MDM command and Apple say so. If you're delivering something that way, it's got to be signed. And we'll skip as many bits of the setup assistant as we possibly can. We have a hidden local administrator account as well. And we randomize its parcel with another process. Um, an important step is that we skip the creation of the local user account, so whoever's provisioning isn't asked to do that. Next up is a smart group. Um, and this group just contains all the Macs that we assigned to that pre-stage we just created, just using a single criteria there. And we need a couple of extension attributes. Again, one for the host name, just so we can store that, and one for its role, so we can store that as well. And these are just simple strings and finally we want a policy that will run as soon as that Mac is enrolled and the Jamf binary is installed on the enrollment complete trigger and all the policy does is it runs a, a script which I'll come to in a moment and we'll scope the policy so it runs on any Mac in that smart group we created 
through any MAC assigned to our pre-stage enrollment. So what, does, what happens? So we've installed Mac OS, we've hit the setup assistant, and we choose our country. I think you've seen this millions of times now. And your keyboard layout. And there's our old pal, the remote management screen. Now at this point, some things happening in the background already. Um, our Mac's enrolling into the MDM part of Jamf, and along with the Jamf binary and framework, our package and our config profile, so all the ingredients we need for Nomad login are being installed. And remember, the setup assistant is not gonna complete until that has happened, until that's done. And now the setup assistant finishes. And remember, our package is post install script we saw earlier, did its thing, it used auth changer, and it made sure that the notify mech of Nomad login replaces Apple's login window. Drum roll, please. And we'll see this. We don't see a login window. That's what we get. So, again, in the background, at some point, Jamf executes its enrollment complete trigger. And that policy that runs a script will do the rest. Um, I'll mention here that Nomad Login has another mech called RunScript. Um, so if you are using other management tools that can't run scripts as part of the enrollment process, you could have Nomad Login run the script instead. But it's beyond this, what I'm talking about. Okay, let's go. So we all love a bit of bash, right? Um, and I'd like to personally thank um, Steve, if he's here. There he is over there for that image. <laughs> thank you very much, Steve. Ooh, there we go. Okay, so first things first, um, we're going to use a little bit of Jamf API, and I believe there are sessions at Macaduck to cover this as well, if you're new to that. Um, so our script will need to send credentials to our Jamf server to use the API. Um, these are usernames, passwords, things like this. Um, we consider security to be kind of important, so we're not going to store those credentials in the script as plain text. Um, we add them as parameters inside the policy that executes the script, so they're not written to disk. Um, for us, um, parameter four is the URL of our, JS, our Jamf Pro server. Um, parameter five is the API account username, and six is its password. So next up, we make, we, um, we'll take a couple of variables. Uh, we want the version number of macOS that's installed, because we'll feed that back with the login, uh, with the uh, notify mech later. Um, we want the Mac serial number as well, because we need that when we make API calls, so we're making those calls to the right computer record. We'll create a function called log, um, so we can just use this to add entries to a log file in case we need to troubleshoot if things don't go quite right. And we want to give the Mac a bit of coffee, keep it awake, so it doesn't fall asleep halfway through setting itself up. Now let's uh, nip any automatic software updates in the bud. So our management tools should be looking after those. And at this point, it's kind of an optional step, and we like the login window to have our own branding. So there's a quick and dirty trick you can use, which is just copy your own wallpaper over the top of Mojave's default one. It doesn't matter if your own one is a JPEG, you can actually change the file extension to HEIC, and it works. Uh, now we do a quick API call to retrieve all the extension attributes from that Mac's computer record in Jamf. We'll dump that as a blob of XML, um, and then we'll just extract the value of the name and role attributes to another pair of variables. So important to note, these variables only get populated if we're reprovisioning an existing Mac where its old computer record is still in Jamf. Um, if the computer record is not in Jamf, or if those <coughs> extension attributes are not set, then these variables are empty. And before we continue, we need to check that the setup assistant isn't running, because this script is run by Jamf's enrollment complete process. That can run while you're still in the setup assistant, or afterwards. It kind of runs when it wants to. 
So we'll check for that. Um, one way I found that works for this um, is by checking for the logged in username and making sure it's not um, underscore MB setup user, because when the setup assistant's running, that's the logged in username. And we'll just put that in a while loop and check every five seconds. Once the setup assistant completes, we can carry on. And we'll do a quick conditional. We'll check to see if the computer name and the user role values we collected earlier are empty. And if they are, we need some user input. So let's assume that's what's the case. We'll run auth changer now to switch Nomad login over to using its user input mech. And then we'll kill the login window to make Nomad login restart with the user input mech. It's a dirty trick, but it works. And then you'll see the user input dialog at that stage. Um, when you're actually running this, it looks quite nice and you don't really see the transition so we can get away with it. Um, we'll wait until now the uh, computer name and role are submitted, which in this case, we look for that output file to exist, which will be written once that data is collected. We read those values back from our output file into a couple of variables. Put those into a chunk of XML each and update the extension attribute in Jamf for the computer record with the Jamf API. So we set those back. We send those to the computer record to set them. So that's for the name and the same for the role. So all the bits are in place and we can now carry on provisioning. Now at this point, the person doing this can walk away because everything else should be automated. Um, and I'll say again, if our computer name and user role extension attributes were already there in the record, we'd have skipped all of this and we would have ended up here. So let's carry on using our same old echo commands that we would for DEP notify. So we'll change the uh, title, main text, status um, to let everyone know what's happening or let our technician know what's happening. And we'll make use of the name and the role and the macOS version variables, which is a bit hard to see there. We can put those into that text just to tell someone, you know, you're, you're, you're provisioning a computer with this version of macOS and it's got this role and this is its name. Um, one other thing I tend to do is if the Mac has a student role, we just change the message a little bit to say it's going to take a few hours to provision while it installs software versus about 10, 15 minutes for staff. We'll set the host name because um, we know it now. We can use the Jamf binary to do that. It's got a function for it, and there are lots of other ways you can do it if you want to. And yeah, we still bind to AD. But we fire that off with a custom trigger, so that works done by another policy in Jamf. We use a lot of custom triggers. They're really useful. Um, and then we can run other custom policy triggers. Um, and really, at this stage, you can do whatever you like. Um, you could install software, whatever you want. Um, in my environment, if we remember, this Max now had its host name and role set. It's in the right smart groups to get the right bits and pieces we think it should need. So one thing we do is we have one custom <coughs> policy trigger called deploy, and all our software install policies use that trigger. But those policies are scoped to the specific lab or specific smart groups for the locations that they, um, or roles of the machines they need to be. And again, if you want to know a bit more about that, I'll put that link up again, because I've documented that in more detail there. Um, and as our policies run, as our packages install, the status text at the bottom of the notify window underneath the progress bar will continuously update as it trawls through the Jamf log. Next up, we run an inventory collection at the end, and we just take this opportunity to use different parts of the host name so we can populate the asset tag and the room um, in the computer record as well. We're quite thorough. And we'll run a software update to catch any security updates, things you don't get with the macOS installer. Um, Apple like to bundle in things like Safari later on or iTunes. Um, we, call that, uh, we call another policy to do that for us. And then we're done. So we let the provisioner know, 
Um, we run off changer again just to reset the authorization DB back so we're using Apple's login window after the Mac reboots. And then we restart after a two minute delay just so we can get time for the policy to write its log back to Jamf. Meanwhile, we've been at the pub <laughs> um, or attending conferences like this one to learn all about the different things we can do to try and improve our MDM enrollment workflows. So thank you again, Joel, um, and everyone else who's contributed to these wonderful tools because it just makes me look like I know what I'm doing. But I probably don't. And thank you. You can do a little screenshot here of, uh, and get to Neil's uh, content and everything else. Uh, so, and Neil's been doing some great stuff. Um, one of the things that I was slightly, uh, not annoyed, that's not the wrong word, but I'd, I'd not thought of a workflow where you actually kill the login window halfway through the workflow to get some of the other mechanisms out. So starting with Nomad Login 1.4, uh, we've already got some ways of making that even smoother. Uh, so that you can stack a notify mechanism, a user input mechanism, and a notify mechanism all behind each other. And if you drop a flag in uh, var temp or someplace else, we won't show those other mechanisms if you don't need it. So I think we've got even a better way of kind of streamlining the great work that Neil's already kind of done. Um, real quick, uh, we've made some changes to the Nomad framework. Uh, that's the engine behind uh, Nomad login that does all the AD interactions. Now we get better user info. Uh, better offline detection. That's going to be merged into Nomad Login AD 1.4, which uh, we're, it's a little weird, but we're kind of almost done with because uh, Neil and a few others have been beta testing it, which has been great. Uh, big new feature in this is password update and migrating users. Um, the password update looks like this in that if you sign in with a user and their password is different in AD than it is locally on the machine, will ask you to type in their current local password, and then we'll update FileVault, Keychain, and the user account back to that AD password, all right? So this way, you can force them always to authenticate to AD if it's there. If not, we'll fall back to local authentication. And if their AD password is different than their local password, they can now go in here, type in their current local password, and then we'll update everything as appropriate. So this gets you really, really close to a mobile account, but still being a local account, all right? It seems like we're doing a lot of work to just make mobile accounts not mobile accounts, but I think this is a good way of solving all of the off-domain issues and the other things that you have. But at the same time, in particular, if you're lab machines like Neil has and some things like that, where a user may not be running Nomad after they sign into the um, Finder, you've got this ability now to update the passwords as appropriate as you go through there. Uh, we're also hoping to have the ability to just stomp on the local password. This is something we still got to put a little more effort into, that if the AD password is different than the local password, we won't even show this dialog box to the user. We'll just blow up their local keychain, uh, create a new one, and then reset their local password to what their AD password is. So that may be a little more appropriate for some of the lab environments and things like that that you have in there. Um, so cool. Uh, if you want to learn more about Nomad Login, we have a workshop tomorrow. Uh, at about this time, we're doing about an hour and a half uh, Joe's uh, got a session. We're right after Joe's session in the morning. Um, and we'll be doing kind of a deep dive into Nomad Login. I'll have a Active Directory domain controller with me, although frankly, that's the least uh, what we're going to be focused on. A lot of it's going to be focused on kind of what Neil's been talking about with being able to use the user input screens, uh, the notify mechanism, and things like that. So you can kind of build out a very robust uh, login environment. And again, if you want to still use the Apple built-in login window, perfectly fine. You're able to use that, so you can still be bound to AD, use mobile accounts and things. If you prefer to use Nomad Login, that's great too. Gives you a little bit more flexibility and some options in there. And with that, uh, I think we're horribly over time, but that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, if we have any questions... Neil, you did an amazing job. Nobody has questions. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Have a good rest of the conference.